So, so here's a flexible ARM processor here, the ID Tech X Show. So hello, so who are you? Hi, I'm uh, Chris Feltner. I'm a VP Technology in ARM. And I just gave a keynote here on uh, IoT and flexible electronics and the future. And one of the things we like about this stuff is that it keeps on continuing on, on Moore's Law beyond Moore's Law. So uh, we've seen huge progress in plastic electronics and over the few year, last few years, integration densities, functionality is coming up, and we've been working with these guys here, Pragmatic, who are actually the experts at designing plastic electronics, and on this particular piece of plastic, they've put down a whole bunch of ARM microcontrollers. This is the ARM one? This is the ARM one, and they've also brought a whole bunch of other things that uh, uh, they've built. So. so this is the one that Sophie Wilson uh, uh, thought of? And, uh, and Steve Ferber actually uh, close, close. designed and everything. No, it, it, they it, have the same same functionality. Yeah, well, it's a uh, you know, 20 years later, but yes, yeah, it's uh, 20 or 30, right? Yeah, yeah. And so this is actually a Cortex M based product. So although it has a complexity similar to the ARM one, it actually is based on the latest Cortex M architecture uh, of ARM. So, so it's, it's like a full 32 bit. Zero? Yes. M0 Plus? 32 bit yeah. microprocessor system on chip. So it includes the memory as well. So this is kind of like a parallel Moore's Law, right? Because Moore's Law and, uh, and uh, regular silicon is going in one way, and this is. Uh, yeah, it's. Well, in plastic integration densities, there is a Moore's Law. It's not Moore's Law, it's somebody else's law, but it is exponentially uh, improving, and that, that's what we are seeing here. How, how were the previous prototypes? What was the rate of. So I think the first version of this we did about two years ago uh, that Mike Muller introduced at TechCon was about seven square centimeters and we're now as you can see down to uh, about one square centimeter uh, and actually we have a version uh, uh, the next version of this is about half the size again so we've got you know something in the region of a 10x reduction in footprint in the space of a couple of years. So, so who are you? So I'm Scott White the CEO of Pragmatic um, so we've been working with ARM so for the last couple of years. ARM actually became an investor in Pragmatic uh, in 2014. Um, and we've been working on a, a range of projects, but in particular looking at how our technology can be applied to uh, implement standard microprocessor architectures such as ARM has, and using that as a, as a vehicle to, to really push the boundaries of the complexity and the functionality that can be implemented with our uh, thin, flexible electronics. So the potential here, if this works out, that this could be in like the, in the table, in the floor, in the chair, and everywhere, because it's so cheap, right? That's right. I mean, the, the, if you look at the, the classic electronics industry view of the Internet of Things, it's very much focused on quite complex products like lighting or cars or, or homes or things like that. Uh, and we're, we're, re we're really looking to push that to everyday objects. So the things that we interact with multiple times an hour or multiple times a minute, uh, you know, so sort of every day of the year, uh, how do those things have some intelligence, some understanding of their environment, and the ability to interact with each other and with, uh, with the humans that are using them. So is this a requirement to make the 100 billion uh, or trillion trillion ARM processors happen? Something well, the, like this is very, could make it happen. Yeah, I mean, that, that's why we're looking at this, is it's one of those technologies that if it takes off, it can be incredibly cheap. It allows you to customize your designs. You can, uh, you don't have to have high volume to be cost effective. It, it can, you know, you can integrate other logic onto this and sensing, sensing around it. So it has some of those properties that could become quite, quite interesting. And, and if you can certainly build these at the few cent level, there's nothing to stop it to proliferate. And uh, who are you? I'm Juan de Oliveira, VP Business Development. So this is an R&D project, as my colleagues mentioned. Uh, at some point in a to-be-defined future, the few square centimeters will become few square millimeters, and then it may become commercially viable and interesting to have ARM processors at one cent or thereabout in almost any object. So there could be a Cortex M0 plus or something in a few square millimeter printed point, plastic? At some point in the future, yes. So the cost will go down, the, 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 the performance and the power budget will go down accordingly. Uh, in parallel will more, more slow, so it is the same logic uh, with the 30, 40 years uh, difference. Yeah. So uh, how, how is it possible to do this? How so, does it work? So, so Pragmatic's key innovations really are in the device architectures and the processing technologies that allow us to do uh, electronics 
very accurately on plastic so we can achieve similar kinds of progression in feature size and yield and performance and so forth that silicon has done but do that with materials on very thin film plastic so as you can see here this is actually a uh, our latest generation material set um, which is actually less than 10 microns thick for the entire material stack so that includes the, the plastic substrate which is actually most of that and all of the electronics including the interconnect layers and the devices within the ic so as you can imagine, sort of doing that on, on something that is that thin and flexible uh, isn't as easy as silicon where you have a nice rigid wafer that stays put exactly where you left it and, and therefore you can align to, to very precise uh, accuracy. So our key innovations really are how we pattern accurately on these kinds of materials and in particular how we ensure very good registration between the different layers so that we can actually get uh, very good yield, very good consistency in, in uh, performance characteristics and therefore make an integrated circuit. So uh, I, I don't want to ask too much, but I'm, I'm wondering, is it just one layer? Nope. It's, no? uh, it's actually a, that's about a 10 layer. 10 layer on ten. plastic? Yeah. How is it possible? <laughs> <laughs> um, just by uh, a lot of uh, hard work, really, on developing processing, Different processing steps. You have, you have different material layers for the semiconductor, the, uh, the dielectric, the, the equivalent of the poly layers in, in a silicon stack and so forth. So, so there's a lot of materials innovation, obviously, in, in actually getting the materials right with appropriate characteristics. But then also building up that stack is, is somewhat different to silicon, you know, where you're actually adding materials sort of layer by layer at a time. In one sense, it actually, you know, certain things become easier because we can add additional layers very easily into that stack because it's just adding a few more steps in the process, doing the same thing again to add another metal interconnect layer, for example. So you print the whole thing in one go or you have to come over It's printed back layer by layer. Layer by layer, yeah. precisely on plastic. Yeah. And, and I'd say that's where the key innovation is, is how you get the precision in, in each of those layers and also in the registration between the layers even though the plastic might be moving or expanding or contracting in between those process steps. So we hear the ID Tech X show, there's lots of stuff about printer electronics and stuff. So you have to get the cutting edge printer and, <laughs> and all this stuff and the materials. Printing is a, uh, well, printing is a somewhat vague term that's used to define lots of things. Um, some people define what we do as printing, others don't. Um, we don't get very involved in the religious argument of what it's called. Uh, we use a mix of print-like technologies as well as conventional electronics processing technology. In fact, the company name, Pragmatic, is very representative of the approach we've taken. It's all about achieving the right kind of materials with the right kind of patterning, the right kind of performance. Whether we use printing or not, actually our customers don't care. Of course. But so, so, so uh, <laughs> is there more you can show here? Well, there's some, uh, some uh, NFC devices, for example. So this is a, a printed antenna. That one of our devices that does the harvesting here and does the bridge on the antenna at the same time so it's a dual function both the electronic harvesting and driving as well as the bridge which reduces the integration for a such device so this is on uh, PEN uh, 50 microns and uh, our devices there uh, were uh, so this is PET so the, the substrate is PET and our device was on PN and we moved to polyamide in that case right and these so those are um, logic devices, those are NAND gates, NOR gates, flip-flops and so on that are processed on the wafer and then they can be laser diced and picked in place to create subsystems and integrated in traditional electronics way. So it's worth clarifying that although you know, what, we're, what we're working on with ARM in doing a full microprocessor is where we see the future evolving, the near-term applications tend to require much simpler functionality. Uh, again, you know, very, very close comparables if you go back to the 1970s in silicon you know, microprocessors started to grow, but you actually had a lot of uh, a lot of applications that were solved with discrete components, and discrete logic gates, and so forth. Um, so we have similar products where you have individual logic gates that can be easily uh, mixed and matched to create certain functionality, as well as basic sort of standard product types like RFID or, or NFC that uh, that meet the requirements of what people want to deploy in applications are, today. Are, are some of your products on the market? Uh, they're in, uh, there's a number that are in uh, pilot uh, trials. We're actually in the process at the moment of scaling up production capacity for full commercial rollout. So we actually just announced that on Monday, um, that we're investing now in uh, our first volume production line uh, called the FlexLogic system, which will be commissioned through 2017. And so by 2018, we'll have a production capacity of over a billion ICs per annum. Billion? Yeah. 2018? Yeah, next year. <laughs> 
And That's a billion cool. sounds like a lot, but actually in the context of the markets we're going after, that tends to be you know, entry level, if you like, for, so for what people actually need. So that's a billion more arm license sold every year? Well, eventually, yes. Eventually. Yeah, 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 yeah. So is it... Units will not be arm processors, obviously. Are, are, you, uh, are you encouraging them to get uh, ARM Cortex A73 and Mali uh, GPU on here, or...? Uh, no. Uh, no? I'd be very happy with the, the you know, the, the M0 or an M-1 happening. I, in, in my view, it's, uh, uh, it's all about the function at some level of general purpose processing to be available. And then this is an ideal substrate for customization around it. So I don't think this game is all about high performance. This is about low cost and customizability and integration. So. I hope that uh, with a new uh, kind of like structure and arm that now you're speeding up innovation and you're making, you're helping to get things like this sooner and faster out there. Oh yeah, we definitely want that. That's something we've always wanted and, and we're still working hard on it. Yeah. All right. And, uh, if you have something like this, where do you connect it? How would it work? Uh, to, like, the so you can very easily see actually the contact pads uh, around the outside of the, the IC layout. So as uh, Chris mentioned, you know, it's not just the cost and form factor of the individual IC that is interesting, but actually the ease of integration into novel form factors. So th this is essentially a fully packaged device already. Um, it doesn't need to be put inside a plastic box with metal legs on it to stick on a PCB. That can be basically cut out from that plastic and directly stuck on with a conductive adhesive onto a flexible substrate like an antenna or, or something like that. So it allows very easy integration so that the entire form factor of the end product can be thin, flexible and very low cost. So you can, uh, you can glue that, stick that together with a flexible display? on top and a flexible battery under and that's it? Yeah, yes. Yeah. You could, yes. And a few more flexible things? <laughs> as many flexible things and as you like. Mast. Or, yeah. or non-flexible things. I mean, interestingly, we've seen actually in, in many applications, the thinness is what people are really interested in, in even more so than the flexibility. Um, so be able to embed functionality within a PCB, for example. Uh, and so you get a, a semi-active PCB for integrating glue logic in between high-end ASICs or things like that. So, so there's, a, there's a whole range of applications for this, some of which we've only just started to, to really tap into understanding what people want to do with the technology. So how are you going to optimize the yield and, uh, and the, the, the life, uh, how, how the reli reliability and stuff like so that? So fundamentally, because the, the materials are you know, flexible and, and, and plastic, it is already quite robust. In fact, we've seen that in certain applications that just that resistance to um, to flexing, obviously, but also to impact, to dropping, things like that, um, compared to silicon is a big advantage in certain applications. In terms of lifetime, that's something we'll have to build up statistical data over time. We know the fundamentals of the materials are quite good for, uh, for extended lifetime applications, but we obviously don't have the 40 or 50 years of silicon history to be able to prove that to go into long lifetime. But actually, if you look at most of the applications that want to use this technology, they tend to be comparatively short lifetime compared to what you were used to. This is not generally oriented towards an electronics product that you buy and want to use for the next 10 years. It's oriented towards putting it into, as you said earlier, tables, chairs, packets of cornflakes, you know, whatever else, things that have a kind of relatively short life in how we're interacting with them. So they might be you know, on the shelf in a retail store for a few months and then like might be used card. for a couple of days. Yeah, a business card or something like that. Uh, uh, is it recyclable material? All this you can just reuse? Most, um, most of it is. There's it, another thing. Our semiconductor is not organic. So we are inorganic semiconductors. So that gives us a bit of leeway compared to organic materials in, in, the, in the life cycle and shelf life and functional life as well. All right. So, really looking forward to the 2018 uh, billion billion chips that you're going to print out. Cool. Great, man.